Praise God. Praise him. He is um, magnificent and awesome God. Um, last week, we ended the uh, service with a challenge. And um, to see where you, folks would sit uh, this week. And to see if we would um, become intimate and, and not be afraid to sit uh, next to a fellow member of the family. Amen. And and so while we're sitting pretty tight right now, when we first came in, that wasn't the case. Everybody was, you know, sort of spread out. And, and even after communion, <laughs> you know, you can see folks kind of get up and start to, to move back. <laughs> why, did, why did we challenge you on that? Well, I, I think we challenged us to think about that from the perspective that if we, if we can't get comfortable sitting next to a fellow believer, sitting next to a member of God's family, then how can we really get over that boundary of working together in the way that God requires us, wants us, desires us? Um, we're not comfortable being close and intimate with folks that aren't in our immediate family. Some of us are not even close and intimate with people in our family, which spills over into the family of Christ. Um, what, what's our motivation for, for being close, for being intimate? And, and I submit to you that it is for his pleasure. I need you to listen to this song, if you would, please.
Hallelujah. I am your servant. I was created to worship you, made in your image a faint reflection of your glory. What greater purpose could there be? What greater honor given me that I could offer anything that I could glorify the king? The king who laid his glory down for me. The king who laid his glory down for me. It is for his pleasure. I submit to you that we live, we breathe, and we have our being. There is no other reason. There is no other reason for us to be here. We were not created for us. We were not created for our wives, for our children. We were created for his glory. Amen. So, if we are going to please the Lord, as Jesus Christ himself said in John, the 8th chapter, the 29th verse, he said, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone for I always do those things that please him. What a statement. I always do those things that please him. I know that I don't. I don't always do those things that please him. So I think we must realize that we cannot and will not do do this on our own. It, it, it requires his presence, the, the presence of the Almighty God in us, distributing in each one of us supernatural spiritual gifts to move beyond ourselves and our flesh. See, we won't do it of our own selves, of our, of our own mind. Even if someone asks us to move closer, there's something about the flesh, about our pride, about our fear, about whatever it is that restrains us. And until we release ourselves to the fully and completely to the Holy Spirit, we will not serve him in the way that he deserves, in a way that pleases him. See, we want to serve God in our way. We, we want to do things that we think please him. And so many times in our own hearts and minds, we, we do these things and we fall short because we're not doing them in his will. Somehow we can't get past the the me in, in our lives. Last week we um, covered the essential nature of the spiritual gifts in the proper functioning of the body. And I just want to review that point and a couple of other points as we move forward. Um, turn with me to the first to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. The Lord would not allow me to sort of move past this point. I think he wants us to understand that our spiritual gifts, that each of us having been given a spiritual, at least one spiritual gift, that it is by these spiritual gifts we are able to minister, to serve, to please him for the good of the body. So this verse, in fact, let me start, go back to chapter 13 and... Um, 
I'll start at verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Now, Paul here sandwiched in between the 13th chapter, the book of love, and the 14th chapter, where Paul discusses the, the gift of tongues and prophecy, is, is this phrase, in fact, let me read it for you. How many of you are reading from the King James this morning? Quite a few. And, and the New King James? Okay. All right. So I'm going to read it in the King James. So we can do some comparison here. And it says, verse 1 of chapter 14, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So Paul here is in between this 13th chapter of love, and Paul is saying that the, the greater gift, the, that of excellence, is love. You, you can't, if you have five gifts and you have love, then the other, and you don't have love, the other gifts are, 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 are useless. Without love, we are all just a bunch of people making noise. Amen. Yeah. That's what the scripture says. And then in chapter 14, he, he discusses this issue of tongues. The, the Corinthian church was desiring to, to speak in these other languages. And Paul wants to help them to understand the purpose and, and the use of tongues and and I think he makes the case here that prophecy as a gift may even be better than speaking in tongues. Pastor David started in this uh, chapter last week and is going to, over the next several weeks, I'm sure, um, exposit on uh, this 14th chapter. But right in the middle of 13 and 14, in verse 1, we have these words and desire spiritual gifts. The word and there is, is a particle and in the Greek has the meaning of continuation and, and the sense of moreover or yet. And then the word desire, there is the word zelios. To burn with zeal, to be hot, fervent. And it's in the present tense, meaning it's happening now and continues on. It's also in the imperative mood. So what does mood mean? Mood means it, the, the, the author wants you to understand his attitude about what he's writing. So when you look at these words on, on the paper and desire spiritual gifts, well, you don't get the real sense of what the writer is saying there unless you sort of peel back the onion and understand what the verb is doing and, and what, what the attitude of the writer is. So in the imperative mood, Paul is saying he is making a command. It's not an invitation to, I invite you to seek out and know your gifts. Well, if I invite you 
you have the option of saying, well, no, I'm not coming to that party. Well, this is not an option. This is a command. In uh, chapter 1 of the book of Mark, verse 15, Christ says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That was not an invitation. That was an, a command. That was an imperative command to say, do it and do it now. We have gifts. Our command is to exercise those gifts. It is not an invitation. It is a command. Seek after these gifts. Understand what they are. Employ them in your, in your spiritual lives, in your living. Another sort of detour here, if you will allow me, is when, when we get saved, we are, and, and we know this, but it, this is just sort of a reminder. When we get saved, we, we go from being our own to belonging to the Lord. Amen. You see, he purchased us with his blood. Went to the slave market of sin and purchased us. So we no longer belong to ourselves, nor do we belong to the dominion of sin. We now belong to God. And so our lives are not our own. So our motivation should be, our desire should be to please him. From the time that we get up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night, please him. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do that by having a desire to understand our spiritual gifts that is equal to the call. God's call is significant upon our lives. Our desire for understanding what that call is and how to exercise our spiritual gifts should be equal to that. Nothing less. We should investigate to discover what these spiritual gifts are. So that means getting the, book, getting the book and understanding what the book says about the spiritual gifts. The, the third item that we covered last week was about information for service. So some of us will sit at home and we'll read and we don't understand the word. And so then what we do is we come to, to Bible study on Wednesday. And then the pastor enlightens us about what's in the word. And now we're, we have the information we need to go to work, to be busy. That's the information. God gave us individual gifts, but he also gave us gifts to the body in, per, in people, persons, pastor, evangelists, apostles, they are to teach us, to show us how to exercise these gifts, how to live, how to, how to walk in the light of God. Uh, these are supernatural abilities to affect something or someone. And and so I, I kept thinking, well, what does supernatural really mean? Do we know, understand what supernatural means? So I looked it up, just, just to be sure. And, and, and the meaning is, anything that is above and beyond what exists outside the natural laws and the observable universe. So anything that we can see is natural. So a jet, a 747 jet, taken off, I don't know, tons, it weighs tons. Taken off on the ground is not supernatural power. As powerful as that is, it is not supernatural power. The, the space shuttle going up 
in space yes. and rotating around the earth is not supernatural power. Amen. Supernatural power is above and beyond that power. The only place to get supernatural power is from God, Amen. the creator of heaven and earth, creator of the universe. And then the supernatural power affects things that are not observable. So what comes to mind? Well, the mind, <laughs> the heart, the soul, the spiritual gifts, the supernatural ability to affect a person, a person of Christ, means that we are going to be able to affect their mind, their heart, and soul. If you're going to do that, you have to be in contact with people. You can't affect somebody, their, you, you, you can't affect their mind, their heart, and soul unless you get in contact with them. There is no way. So now my question this morning is in five minutes, do I even continue to open up this package? And the Holy Spirit is saying no. Um, so l let me do this. Renew the challenge. This week, exercise a spiritual gift. Now, you may not know what your spiritual gift is, but let me give you some examples. Those of you who go here to uh, Manor, and those of you who may not, we have a, a community outreach center. And there are, gosh, Sister Thomas, how many people serving in that ministry? 12, 15, 12 or 15 uh, seniors. Average age, now I'm not going to get into anybody's business, so I'll say average age is probably 90. <laughs> That's probably a little high. I'm just messing with Sister Thomas. <laughs> okay. I don't know the average age, but they're older than most people in this room. Amen? Every Monday, they get up and they go out to that building on the side of the church and they exercise spiritual gifts. Now everybody doesn't have the same gift. Some of them have the gift of administration. That's brother um, Bird. He's exercising supernaturally his ability to bring about an organization that delivers food and clothes to on average 80 to 100 people every week, Amen. supernaturally. He's not doing that because you know, he's got skills and talent. He's doing that because he has God-given supernatural ability in his gift. Amen. Others are preparing the food. Others are ex exercising mercy. Others are exercising giving. Others are exercising exhortation. <clears throat> Others are exercising evangelism. In that group, they are exercising their, their, their spiritual gifts for the benefit of the body and for those outside the body because everybody that comes on Mondays is not saved. Amen. I would say the predominant number is not. So, if you want to exercise a spiritual gift, and you may not know, I just gave you four or five that you can experiment with. 
on Monday. What time, Sister Thomas? 10 o'clock? 11 o'clock? We serve at 10. So now if you had, you're looking for an opportunity, there's an opportunity. You don't have an excuse. And then next week, we will continue to unpack this, uh, the message that the Lord has given us about our spiritual gifts. One further challenge, renewed challenge. When we come in next week, don't sit in four corners of the building. I, I know it's a tough barrier to overcome. Please, make, make up your mind that you're going to have a new paradigm, a new change, a shift, and just Push past that barrier. And so I'm going to sit in the first four rows, and I'm going to sit close enough next to somebody that they can smell my breath. Which means you gotta brush your teeth and use some Listerine. Okay, but but in the body of Christ, which resembles it, which which is symbolic of the human body, trillions of cells in our bodies packed together tight in order to work that make us function. Surely, surely if Christ laid down his glory, we can lay down our pride and our fear for one hour. For one hour, can we do that? Now I challenge you. One step further and I'm done. If you come in and you see somebody not in these four rows, <laughs> grab them by the hand and bring them with you. <coughs> Nobody will be sitting beyond these four rows. We're gonna be cells in the body of Christ. Pack it in, shoulder to shoulder. Amen? Amen? Now we're going to, Lord, we're going to trust and see what happens. Father, we thank you so much. God, you are uh, an awesome God that you would lay down your glory.